50 webinars as to this remarkable milestone. What began as a modest beginning, uh, what uh, it was a it was a modest idea for hosting webinars during the challenging times of COVID-19 pandemic has now been evolved into a significant institution for mutual learning and growth. Professionals from across the country eagerly participate our webinars every Friday from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. as we dwell into engaging session on contemporary and engaging uh, emerging topics directly relevant to the corporate world and professionals. Till now, more than 1 lakh 5,000 uh, professionals have registered and participated in this. And 212 uh, speakers from different uh, expertise have participated. Friends, team corporate profession feel deeply humbled and blessed by this journey. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to our distinguished speakers who have generously shared their time and expertise to make this event possible. I welcome all my speakers today, Ms. Uh, Radha Thakur, she is uh, uh, she is additional secretary and she is the chief guest for today's program. Mr. Amarjeet Singh, whole time member SEBI, he is uh, our guest of honor. Mr. V. S. Sundareshan, executive director SEBI. Mr. Amarjeet Chopra, senior partner GSA and past president of ICSI, ICI. Uh, Mr. Amit Tandon, founder and MD, institutional uh, investor advisory service India Limited. Mr. J.M. Gupta, founder and managing director, shareholder empowerment committee. Uh, empowerment service, Mr. Parvati Sam, Chief Legal Officer in CS Tata Steel. Friends, uh, as you are aware that we have done this journey of 150 webinar, 149 webinar. I just want to share the glimpses of this uh, particular webinar uh, of 150 webinar to you. This is just uh, a few minutes slides.
friends, uh, this journey of uh, continuing knowledge sharing will continue because knowledge shared is a treasure gained by all. It has the power to enlighten mind, bridge gaps and empower the world. Let us be the architect of a knowledgeable society where sharing wisdom becomes our greatest legacy. So with this thing, I request Madam Anradha to inaugural, uh, inaugurate our this webinar by her address. And, uh, as you are aware, Anradha Madam is the additional secretary of Ministry of Corporate Affairs. She holds the position of director of serious fraud investigation officer also. She is an exceptional bureaucrat. And earlier, she has served as the additional secretary in cabinet secretary. I welcome Madam and I will request you to just share your wisdom with us related to this topic and inaugurate our session. Over to you, Madam. Thank you so much, Pavan Vijayji. Thank you uh, a lot. And uh, when you were introducing me, I thought that uh, my inaugural speech would be a non-starter because you asked me to share my wisdom. I'm not sure how much of that I have that I can share with everyone, particularly as I sit here just about a year into the job here. But yes, I can share some thoughts from the side of the ministry. And uh, I could see a lot of luminaries on the panel even today. Mr. Amarjeet uh, from SEBI, we have, I have interacted with him in my earlier role as Joint Secretary Deepam. And we used to have a close relationship with SEBI as we still do. And there are other people as well who I do recognize. So thank you for having me uh, inaugurate this very important milestone webinar of corporate professionals. Uh, 150 webinars, every Friday a webinar is something that is really in the spirit of pushing corporate governance by addressing issues, by addressing doubts. And therefore, I'm extremely happy to be here. My time is short today because I have a meeting to run to. But I'll just say four or five points on the topic that he has uh, kept for today's uh, webinar, which is the future of corporate governance. As we know, corporate governance is really the backbone of any successful, ethical, sustainable, not only business, but also the economy as a whole. It serves as a cornerstone that upholds the principles of accountability and the spirit of the Companies Act, as well as the accounting standards, as well as all the standards which are set and followed by the various bodies associated by the, with the ministry, such as the three PIs, NAFRA, SFIO, Com Competition Commission, at the heart of it is pushing more accountable, more transparent corporate governance. These are all the means to reaching those ends, the core end of good corporate governance, because without good and sound, ethical, accountable, transparent corporate governance, we really can't push into the areas of the economy that we want to push, have the kind of confidence that investors need, and therefore expand to the limit that we have set for ourselves, which, as the PM has said, is a $3 trillion economy in a very short time. In today's fast-paced uh, and ever-involving corporate landscape, the challenge for modern corporate governance is exactly this, that everything changes so fast. Not only are economies completely coupled together, but even within the country, Technology changes across the world affect us, change so fast that we have to keep pace in terms of rules and regulations, as well as our understandings. The, the, the sheer pace of change and the sheer dynamism in the way innovation is spreading, particularly in the technology sector and the structures of businesses, the structures of exchanges across the world, that makes it a big challenge to keep pace with corporate governance tools that we have, as well as it creates genuine ambiguities, which uh, organizations like corporate professionals are really trying and giving their contribution in allaying the doubts, in helping in pushing this discussion on the ambiguities which people may feel in terms of the interpretation of rules and regulations. So in that context, bridging regulatory gaps becomes a very important thing. First is the identification of the regulatory gap. 
so if uh, if uh, if we i may just say that even in the budget speech of this year uh, the fm in one of the paras has noted that it is going to be our endeavor and we are shortly going to roll out a number of webinars and interactions with corporates and professionals across the country to have discussions on each and every act under the ministry as the spirit of the budget speeches for the entire government to have a discussion with stakeholders so that people we we get to know as government directly from the stakeholders as to what their interpretation is is there a regulatory gap that they are seeing if they are they seeing some sort of overreach are they identifying a area in which we need to come in so those those workshops are going to start happening but bridging these gaps is a multifaceted uh, problem it is a multifaceted rather an issue and it is something which needs to be continuously dealt with the whole concept of uh, in doing in in doing a good collaborative effort to identify and bridge gaps what we are really trying to do is to set a level playing field so that each professional each business has a similar understanding of what the rules and regulations are government also understands what the requirements of the different stakeholders are and we keep pace by looking into our rules and seeing whether a clarification is needed in the law whether a clarification about the rules is needed whether an amendment is needed and we all keep working together because my assumption when i'm saying this is that our goal is the same our goal is higher and more stable corporate governance and therefore more sound principles in which we collectively work the ethical imperative of corporate governance cannot be overemphasized we have i have said that in the beginning and i would like to close again with that that instilling good corporate culture that prioritizes all of the things that i have said means that good businesses accountable businesses need to feel incentivized at the same time mr pavan vijay mentioned my other role as director of sfio i feel that swift and speedy action against corporate misdemeanor also promotes corporate governance so that those people who are actually going by the books going by the rules and regulation feel incentivized that yes those that don't follow that do get punished by the system as they should therefore at the end i would like to conclude by saying that i'm again i would like to congratulate corporate professionals for this long series of webinars that they've held over such a long time painstakingly during covid and then after covid so that was a challenge in itself but after covid where the push for a webinar has ended but even then you are continuing to hold webinars continuing to do your job to put your efforts to contribute to the cause of better corporate governance by providing this platform where so many stakeholders come together so many questions are asked you try to address the doubts of people and i would believe each time an a uh, webinar is held we incrementally improve corporate governance by improving everyone's understanding and clarity with that i would sincerely hope that everyone contributes participates fully in the webinar which is about to take place and heartiest congratulations and all the very best and all the best to the panelists who, who have also come as well as all the participants thank you so much i'm sorry i will not be able to wait for the whole session which i would have liked to do but i really need to go thank you so much thank you thank you very much madam i know you have a meeting in mha Uh, that is very important, and uh, despite of your uh, rushing for the meeting, you have spared your time. I we are we all are grateful to you, and your word of wisdom is uh, really appreciable to all of us. So thank you, madam. Thank you for giving us uh, this time and your word of wisdom. Thank you. All the best for the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. So now turning to the topic of today's webinar. we are fortunate to have a galaxy of other distinguished expert who will guide us through vital discussion concerning the ever evolving landscape of corporate governance over the next two two hours we will emerge in thoughtful conversation on a wide range of critical topics in the world marked by intense competition and the and the pervasive influence of disruptive technology there is no denying the importance and relevance of today's subject the future of corporate governance insight and perspective previously people were saying cash is the king and today the governance is the king if you want to survive in any aspects 
So the follow the governance and the the everything will follow you uh, in the way. This is the month which will be the future. So friends, just I will take that today what we are discussing. We are discussing bridging regulatory gap, which Madam S said just now. Then we are discussing future trends in corporate governance, and then in this we want to discuss about the few corporate governance because there's a greater focus on sustainability, diversity, ethical use, emerging technology, reflecting the evolving needs of expectation of stakeholders. These trends aim to create more accountable, transparent, and responsible corporate structure. Today we will discuss the evolving role of independent director and. Few of the members are the itself with the independent director of various board. Uh, how do independent directors adapt in, to the changing corporate landscape, and what does this role empath can encompass in today's context? Then come to the investor stewardship. That is a concept which is now very popular and and taking shape. Investor stewardship refers to the responsible management and oversight of the investment by institutional investor, where they actively engage with. Companies to protect and enhance the value of their portfolio. The practice involves exercising voting rights, advocating and sustainable practice, and promoting long-term value creation. Friends, in the same context, another topic which we will discuss today: shareholders' activism, influence, and accountability in corporate decision making. We will dwell into how shareholder activism shapes corporate strategy and hold business accountable. Then come to the transparency, which is the crux of corporate governance. Satyam Bad Dharmam Chair, that is the point. The transparency is the foundation of good governance, and transparency is the bedrock of the corporate governance. We will discuss how transparency fosters trust and ethical behavior. Then we have shaping tomorrow's boardroom and enhancing board effectiveness, where we will discuss how the diversified leadership succession planning are the key element of boardroom dynamics. we will discuss the importance of embracing a diversity not only in the terms of gender and ethical and uh, uh, gender equality but also skill and expertise the board effectiveness are is also essential because without board effectiveness you can't run and you can't run the proper governance system also <laughs> sorry then we have a global trends in corporate governance the world is connected and so it corporate governance what global trends should be aware of uh, of how do they imp uh, impact our decision making i want to express my heartful thanks to all our esteemed speaker mr amarjit singh he is a whole time member of sebi with over three decades of extensive extensive experience in the regulation and supervision of securities market he played a pivotal role in implementing various primary market reforms shaped in the conceptualization of establishment of social stock exchange and the associated ecosystem i welcome amarji sir for your word of wisdom and your keynote address will definitely help us and guide us to follow the new dimension then we have mr vs sundarishan is executive director sebi with 32 years experience in development regulation and protecting the interest of investors in indian security market he has held roles of and has supervised more than 500 investigation cases related to market manipulation insider trading takeover a public issue collective investment scheme complies with continuous listing and requirement and board i welcome mr sundarish then we have mr amarji chopra he is a senior partner gsa and associate llp and past president icai he is a he served as a chairman of the national advisory committee of accounting standard from 2014 to 2018 during which he is responsible for the implementation of india as in india he also chaired the committee task with revising caro 2016 he has been a member of mc committee on address various issues Related to accounting and accounting profession, he is thorough professional and I think one of the uh, in most intelligent and knowledgeable chartered accountant in India. I welcome Amit Sir for this program. Then we have Mr. Amit Tandon. 
is the founder and managing director of institutional investor advisory service limited india limited he was a managing director of fitch relating until 2012 11 during this time at fitch he played a pivotal role in development of debt market before joining fitch amit sir served as a senior vice president and head of corporate bank of icsi security this is one issue hona i welcome you amit sir for this program <laughs> then we have mr gn gupta ji is a founder and managing director of stakeholders empowerment service he is over 44 years of diversity and professional experience in the public and private service and former executive director of sebi currently is a member of sebi primary advisory committee and capital market committee of fiki i welcome gupta ji for this program then mr parvati sam he is the chief legal officer and company secretary of tata steel he possesses 19 years of experience in the field of governance disclosure reporting risk management ethics and compliance and shareholder management he has been earlier affiliated with iconic companies that have set benchmark in corporate governance he serves as a various committee in regulatory industry and professional body that contribute to the shaping governance principle for corporate in india friends these are our galaxy of speaker you can understand they are the always part and parcel of the some uh, system of governance either in the part of accounting or the shareholder activities as a regulator and today when we'll have a discussion on wide area of understanding and knowledge it will be a great pleasure for all of us so uh, before going to this i just uh, want to tell this that this program which we are doing it is until today there are one lakh five thousand people have registered and joined in various program on on 150 program which we have done and without our part our webinar is incomplete without our participants now i would like to request congratulate to our top five participants uh, to sense of our webinar who joined from across the country uh, these are the people who have attended the most webinar and just we want to recognize them Well, first is Mr. Ramanna Murthy Mala. He has attended. He is a former executive director, Royal Bank of Scotland. He attended one twenty-four webinars till now. Then we have Mr. Ajit Mandlik, director, strategic outdoor media solution. He has attended one hundred eighteen webinars. Then Mr. B K Subramaniam, head legal and Parval Parval Legal Loss Associate. He attended one hundred ten webinars. <coughs> Then we have Abdul Rahim Rahim. Advocate Insolvency Professional, he has attended 109 webinar, and then Mr. Radha Vijay Raghavan from Chennai, she has attended 97 webinar till now. So these are the people who have contributed in our journey. So I thank everybody, and in a token of love and affection, our publication we will send it to them. So thank you all. Now I will request our Jit Sir to share. His keynote address on future trends in cap corporate governance. Over to you, Amit sir. Thank you, Pawan, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of this uh, virtual event, and <laughs> I compliment corporate professionals and Pawan and and your team for achieving this milestone of 150 uh, programs. We're conducting the 150th webinar. and it is my pleasure to be a part of this i would also like to compliment you for keeping this agenda of corporate governance high in your list so that is very welcome and i particularly like the topic today which gives us a chance to take a shot on the evolving landscape of corporate governance so as you know over the last 25 years or so sebi has been very keenly engaged in in development and regulation of of this space in evolving the high standards of corporate governance in our country so this engagement essentially stems from our mandate of investor protection and to state the obvious good corporate governance is very very vital for investor protection and that is why Uh, we have a very deep interest in the subject from sebi side uh, so let me you know present my 
reflections in in two parts so one uh, let me talk a little bit about the increasing significance of corporate governance in the context of uh, our securities markets which is developing very fast and secondly let me you know talk about some specific trends uh, which uh, to my mind are very important for the future of corporate governance so let me start with the first part uh, the increasing significance of corporate governance so today the size of our economy is 3.73 trillion in usd and the market cap to gdp ratio for uh, both the exchanges bsc and sc at the end of financial year 22 23 it was well over 94% as compared to 25 to 50% during 1990s so the projection is that we would become a 7 trillion economy by 2030 and uh, obviously the financial sector will continue to play a very instrumental role in the in the growth of our economy and going by the recent trends of market cap to gdp ratio which i just mentioned our market cap should increase to 7 trillion by 2030 near about so uh, this in turn implies that i mean what does it imply this growth in economy um, in the context of corporate governance so first thing which we need to understand is that the size of our uh, listed companies as well as well as number of new listed entities which would list on the stock stock exchanges it would increase substantially in the coming years so and you just suppose this with the fantastic growth in the number of investors both institutional as well as retail in the recent years and this growth in number of investors is likely to continue in the coming years as well just to give you a couple of data points according to estimates the number of retail investors in indian stock markets as a percentage of total population is around 5% whereas for usa the number is as high as 55% mutual fund assets under management to gdp ratio is currently around 16% whereas the global average is around 75% so we have a good runway in the coming years in terms of growth potential so this you know potential increase in the penetration of securities market it clearly sets the stage for greater significance for corporate governance in the coming years so in my view accomplishing corporate governance premium will be increasingly more critical for companies particularly for those who aspire for higher valuation a lower cost of capital and those who wish to maintain trust and faith of investors in our securities market so driven by these incentives i would like to believe that corporate governance will hopefully become more central without requiring much of a regulatory push till such time it becomes more mainstream till such time it becomes a greater part of companies dna regulators we as regulators we will continue to hear this sort of a if i can say misplaced noise that the cost of compliance is very high laws are complex where is time for business are we here only to comply i mean this is what we keep hearing uh, so i honestly hope that going forward decibel levels around this noise will reduce and companies will see value in good corporate governance practices so let me also qualify many good companies do this today also so i'm not trying to paint everybody with the same brush rather than seeing it as a burden or a avoidable cost so that will perhaps make the job of regulators little easy in any case given the significance of the subject driven by their mandate of investor protection regulators will have to keep a watch on the developments and work towards ensuring greater transparency greater fairness and minimize conflicts of interest uh, regulators will also have to carefully balance 
these objectives with the ease of doing business and they will also continue to step in with appropriate enforcement action in case of misconduct to set a deterrence in the market. So let me now turn to the second part of my address in terms of some uh, specific trends which I see uh, would influence the landscape in the coming years. And some of those trends are already happening. So first is hyper digitalization of economy and acceleration of AI. See, we, digitalization is not new. AI is not all that new. What is happening is the pace at which these things are changing. So that is of, that is of interest. So these trends, both hyper digitalization and acceleration of AI present both opportunities and risks to the companies. So some questions, very obvious questions are how AI is currently used by the company and its competitors, how AI may disrupt the industry uh, or the business the company is engaged in, uh, what are the strategic implications and risks associated with AI products and services? These are just some illustrative questions which are becoming more important for company boards and management. Similarly, the boards will have to pay more attention on relatively new risks, particularly relating to data breaches, uh, data privacy, cybersecurity, integrity of software systems, etc. So another related point is that the board, company boards and management will have to have the relevant expertise and tools to deal with these uh, you know, uh, new issues. Second uh, important trend, according to me, would be the purpose of the corporation, purpose of the company, and stakeholder versus shareholder primacy. This debate has been there. It has actually gained more momentum in the last few years. And uh, uh, as we all know, for decades, a share owner-centric model has been prevalent, with the focus being on what duty boards and companies owe to their share owners. We are now seeing a dramatic expansion of what various stakeholders believe good governance should consist of and take into account. It is moving from shareholders to various stakeholders. Companies are increasingly expected to consider not just their investors' bottom line interests in their decision-making process, but also the interests of employees, suppliers, local communities, and the society at large. So the th another related point is that ESG is here to stay, an area where the shift to the model of stakeholder primacy appears most evident is the ESG space, where there is a growing expectation that companies embody sustainability policies and practices in their operations and make associated disclosures regarding the same. And this push is coming more from investors than anybody else. I mean, regulators are also at it now, but the greater push has come from investors in the recent years. So if you see the ESC landscape, there seems to be some pushback against the ESC agenda, but there is also a simultaneously increasing call for greater transparency, consistent and comparable disclosures, and also concerns around, and that's where regulators have to play a more important role uh, where it comes to regulatory action, need for regulatory action against greenwashing. Uh, a number of regulators across the globe are shifting from from comply or explain regimes to mandatory regimes in terms of the disclosure requirement. ISSP, uh, the International Sustainability Standard Boards, has also issued global standards on sustainability and climate-related disclosures. In India, as uh, most of you would know, we have BRSR that requires companies to make tangible disclosures on their ESG performance. And if I can point out, as part of BRSR, what is more relevant for the company boards for the, from the angle of corporate governance we very clearly set out what are the expectations from the company boards and management in terms of their sustainability engagements. So going forward, I believe that the focus of investors and regulators 
on the corporate sustainability ecosystem will continue to increase. Let me move to another point, stewardship and shareholder activism. So uh, the profile of engagements between institutional investors and companies is also growing uh, thanks to the mandatory stewardship board which SEBI had introduced for institutional investors a few years back. Uh, many jurisdictions have this code, but that is more on comply or explain basis, whereas uh, we have a mandatory uh, requirement around what institutional investors should do when it comes to voting uh, in the companies where they hold the shares. So if you look at the voting data for that again, gives you some emerging trends there as to how institutional investors are playing a role uh, in, in the affairs of the companies where they are invested in. If you look at the voting data for Nifty 500 companies for 2022, it shows that the highest dissent by institutional investors were related to ESOPs, slump sales, sale of substantial undertakings, RPTs, related party transactions and director appointment and remuneration. So this reflects that a number of institutional investors now focus on compensation, capital allocation and transparency. So increasing institutional investor participation, both domestic and global and rising influence of proxy advisory firms are leading to higher standards of stewardship. Um, as shareholder activism continues to gain momentum, it can drive further improvements in corporate governance. And I think this will be an interesting area to watch uh, uh, for some good constructive outcomes going forward. Uh, let me come to my last point in terms of importance of setting a corporate culture. Uh, it may sound a bit cliched, uh, you know, when, when I say that while compliance with the rules is important, good corporate governance is not a checkbox uh, exercise. This we hear very often. Uh, it is about creating a culture of integrity, transparency, inclusivity, and accountability. Uh, so that, you know, the trust of investors, trust of share stakeholders is maintained. But the problem is that the culture is... Uh, a relatively abstract dimension, and that is less clearly defined, is hard to measure, and it is also not discussed as often as other issues are. Uh, globally, some banks and financial institutions have begun to conduct cultural audits. I hope going forward, the knowledge and understanding of the culture of companies will increasingly be under the spotlight. In the Indian context, we made some effort in this direction. The SEBI LODR, apart from mandating specific requirements related to company votes, also sets out certain basic ethical principles that outline the essence of expectations of SEBI from the boards. And these are very simple common sense asks. There is an emphasis on doing the right thing for the right reasons, asking the right questions, possessing an independent perspective and avoiding group think or the group thinking. So in my view, you do not really need a detailed rule-based regime if these simple ethical principles are followed in true spirit. So let me now kind of wrap it up. Uh, corporate governance has always been a complex area. It is rapidly evolving. It is driven by, I mean, the, what I tried to narrate, uh, it is driven by factors such as technological advances, increasing demands for sustainability, social responsibility, uh, movement from uh, shareholders to uh, multiple stakeholders, growing emphasis on diversity, inclusion, etc. Nevertheless, you know, at a more fundamental level, trust remains the ultimate currency in corporate governance. It is hard to earn, easy to lose, and impossible to recover if lost. So it is our collective responsibility to ensure that the trust of investors and society in financial markets is not compromised. Thank you.
Pavan, you are not audible. Okay. Sorry, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for your interesting point which you have come out related to this. The most important thing is the culture audit. And the culture audit, which I was reading there, that you have to see the ethical standard of the company, leadership style you have to check, you have to check employee engagement, you have to check communication channel between all stakeholders, diversity and inclusion, risk management, compliance and innovation. All these things comes under the culture audit of any company under the governance. And I think you have rightly pointed out, this is the future and Amarjit sir is sitting here so now the, all the auditor has to do this work also in the governance audit. They are not doing corporate governance. They will do the culture audit of the company also that what types of culture they have. And I, I think it will be a yardstick for some time because sometimes we say you are a good company. So sometimes a good company may be there, but whether culture is sustainable or not, that is also very important. So you have clearly hit the nail uh, in the correct place. And I hope that this particular thing will come and future trends, which you have mentioned of the ESG and the technology and AI. And I was just uh, seeing this, the way AI is taking place, the way the new players are coming in the market with AI, uh, with, Recte, uh, with various um, uh, FinTech companies, various broking companies, then regulator has to be more active and other people are also have to be more active. So with this thing, thank you very much, sir, for your uh, keynote address, which is really a eye opener and helpful to us and understand that how much gap is there in Indian capital market keeping in the US data, which we are seeing. And you have given a good point that 7 billion, uh, 7 trillion uh, market capitalization concept, which is also a good point and good yardstick for this. So thank you, Amaji, sir, for your word of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. So now I will move on. Uh, our next topic is uh, that is uh, uh, that will take by um, uh, none other than Amarji Singh Chopra, Amarji Chopra, sir. And he's the past president of ICI and the, one of the finest uh, independent uh, directors and auditor. And we will discuss with him the future of corporate governance and the evolving role of independent directors and other aspects which he can share with us with his experience. Over to you, Amarji, sir. Thank you, Pavan. Uh, I'm really grateful to you for this opportunity. Having heard uh, Amrada ji and uh, Amarji ji, for that matter. Uh, and of course, congratulations to you for 150th program and uh, making a part of this milestone that you have achieved. And that too on corporate governance, which has been a subject very, very dear to one's heart. See, whenever I look at uh, the corporate governance structure today, yes, I, I will not say that one will like to brush, um, paint uh, every company with the same brush for that matter. But I feel really concerned and concerned on certain very valid grounds. The reason being that uh, if I, I think it is yesterday's newspaper or day before yesterday's newspaper, which says that uh, the Indian banks had to write off 25 lakh crore rupees. 25 lakh crore rupees. I think this figure is staggering one. And that too in the last seven to eight years with regard to the non-performing assets. No, after all, if these non-performing assets have arisen, in the banking sector and that too of a magnitude of 25 lakh crores. It is certainly a reflection to some extent on the corporate governance of the companies as well. And it, it is certainly a reflection even in certain cases of the governance of the banks itself also. Now the point is that it's fine to say that we have written off 25 lakh crore rupees. But who is responsible? Who is accountable? All there could be certain cases, very few cases, where there are cases of business failures. And, uh, and if it's a business failure, and if you write up certain amounts, absolutely no issue on that. 
But in our case, I think it's more than the business failure. It's not business failure in all the cases. But rather, business failure cases are very few. And scams are far, far more than that. I think, Pawanji, you may be knowing better than me that under IBC today, average haircut by the bank is 70%. Yes. Average haircut. In the first case, which was decided by the Hyderabad, the haircut was 94%. Yes. So this, is a, this is a serious trend, which reflects as to what has been happening, both in the banks as well as in the corporate world. So I'm not exempting even the banks from that governance angle, basically. To me, there are certain pillars of corporate governance. When we talk of ethics, when we talk of competence, when we talk of sustainability, when we talk of the excellence, there are certain pillars of the corporate governance. And the pillars of the corporate governance to me are promoters, the management, the directors, the auditors, the regulators. And if I have to start soul searching and find out an answer as to who has actually let down the corporate governance in this country, my answer is each one of them. Each of the pillars has failed. Each of the pillars actually collapsed, not even failed, if you ask me. Promoters have a reason. I don't want to get into that. Managements become more akin to the promoters. Basically, they want to serve the purpose of the promoters. They want, don't want to serve the interest of the stakeholders. They want to serve the interest of the promoting shareholders. That's the problem. Directors, including independent directors, I think whether independent directors are really independent, that's one of the questions which we need to ask to ourselves in any case. Because the independent directors come through the promoters only. Now, whether nomination and remuneration committees in the various companies have played that role effectively of choosing the independent directors, I think there is a question mark on that. And NRCs cannot continue to function the way these are functioning today if at all the concept of independent directors has to evolve and has to play a very important role. If promoter gives one name and you come up with one name, I don't think that's the way the independent directors are to be chosen. There could be a list of three or four and NRC must apply their minds to this and then try to come to a conclusion who is most suited to a particular role. I think Amarjit Singh Ji made a very, very valid point that in India now, it is the artificial intelligence, it is the IT which is going to be playing a disruptive role. Now, if this is going to play a disruptive role, I think at least on every board, this is what I feel. And I, I why SEBI cannot mandate it even for that matter. You should have a person who is IT specialist or have, having an IT expertise. You have boards in which there could be three chartered accountants, two chartered accountants, more than one. I, I think we need diversity on the boards. Unfortunately, at times we want either engineering-centered boards or finance-centered boards or banking-centered boards. I don't think that's the purpose. And one thing I don't know, Pawanji, it may, I, I, may, I may not be mistaken. I, I should not be mistaken by somebody when I say if you lay down criteria like that no one women director is a must. Now, this reservation system does not work for good governance. Let's be very clear about it. I think when you pick up a particular candidate, if, if a woman is really competent, you pick up by one. You can pick up two, you can pick up three. Why it should be laid down that you need to have one woman, tomorrow you may say that you have to have one from this category, one from this category, one from this category. I don't think that's the purpose to, that's going to serve any useful purpose. You need to have people who are actually competent and who are capable enough to raise their voice if something wrong is happening. I think that's very important. Unfortunately, that voice is missing somewhere or the other. 
gone are the days to my mind when an independent director could walk in for a meeting pick up cashew nuts put it in the mouth and then come out i don't think that's can happen anymore the way the liabilities are emerging for the independent directors i think if we know one of the cases where the independent directors bank accounts were freezed by the court with a lot of difficulty they had to get it actually defreeze to the extent that at least their maintenance expenses can be met on a month monthly basis now if that is the way the liabilities are coming and if the institutions don't improve you may find a time that people may shirk to become independent directors on the board the competent people i'm talking about people will say why should i get on to the board for that matter and then the point is on the other side one one talks of the director the other point is the auditors now suddenly you have seen in the last few years spate of resignation by the auditors yes why why what the same auditors who were continuing there for last 3 years or 4 years suddenly resigned from that particular company giving one reason or the other reason no i i i think this is something which the sebi may undertake a research or mca may undertake a research why so many auditors are actually resigning from the boards where they were continuing earlier i can well imagine that an auditor goes in the first year comes to a conclusion that probably i chose a wrong client and can resign but if an auditor had been continuing for 3 years or 4 years in a particular company and suddenly he is resigning and the reason that he gives may be baffling i think something needs to be done about that if you want to improve the corporate governance in the companies and suddenly the other auditor comes up and says i am willing to accept the audit and he comes out with an audit report which is without a qualification which is without a modification that's the most surprising aspect i have been really feeling concerned that there are few firms in this country which are trying to grab every opportunity where the other auditor leaves so some of the auditors may not like my comment but i think this is the way i have led my life i have to be very categorical about this you you can't keep on accepting the assignments where people are resigning on accounts of certain very specific grounds now in one of the cases recently what has happened is and that is where i am feeling concerned and i you like i today also in the morning i was addressing somewhere how do you look at misrepresentation and fraud and i think here the judiciary has played a role and i think amarjit ji touched upon that particular area also if we need good corporate governance we need a, a good judicial system also which comes up with the decisions very fast and i think another you also talked about this particular part you can't have a judicial system where you are unable to decide the things now there are certain cases even with mc uh, with mc lt today they have been unable to decide for the last 5 years last 6 years how how it can happen how it improves the corporate governance for that matter and how it really incentivizes any of the good governing companies for that matter it actually puts a disincentive to that so what is important to my mind is that at times the regulators themselves have, have to share the blame i have when i was talking about misrepresentation i will just quote one example one of the companies i i think one of the largest groups in the country today represented to the auditors that this particular party or contractor is not a related party on their website it is very clear that it is a related party they themselves more or less acknowledge that it is a related party then should it be treated as a misrepresentation or as a fraud i think the people who are charged with governance how can they get away with this particular part of it and that is where probably the role of the audit committee chairman the role of the other independent directors comes into play for that matter and i to my mind one of the pitfalls has been we have been talking of everything but what about cfos what about uh, even the company secretaries and even the regulators to a very large extent have failed very frankly now when i talk of uh, the write off of the uh, 25 lakh crore barring mr raghuram rajan 
who ordered for asset quality review nobody ordered for the asset quality review and had he not ordered for the asset quality review nobody would have known what is the actual level of the nps in this country i think for years together it kept on happening ever greening of the accounts and in some of the cases the reserve bank of india itself kept on giving special dispensation to certain accounts to be classified as nps so what i am saying is that all the all all the pillars of the governance whether these were promoters these were the management directors auditors or regulators failed again i may say it it does not apply to all the companies but it applies to a very good number of cases for that matter <laughs> diversity of the boards i have already talked of and uh, whether an auditor is an independent uh, audit uh, whether a director is an independent director or not that is a big question mark to my mind there are few committees which are very very important from the independent directors one is the audit committee other is the nrc risk management committee now the csr committee and i personally feel the it committee has to play a very very important role when i say it committee it is information technology committee for that matter in audit committee you cannot have a person who himself is not aware of what is accounting standard or what is an auditing standard let's be clear but companies do have such for people very friendly if people do not know as you are talking of indias for that particular matter no unless you are yourself aware an independent director the audit committee chairman himself is aware of where which is which are the areas where the flaws can take place so far as the, the financial uh, statement distrust is concerned i don't think uh, it it can work well under any circumstances yeah unless he can challenge the cf unless he can challenge the auditors what is happening today is some of the audit committee chairman and the audit committee members would ask the auditor are you satisfied and the auditor would say yes i am satisfied and you say it's fine i think this is the statement which has been made by mr ajay bhushan pande the chairman of the nfra also that's not good enough you should be able to challenge him somewhere or the other i can tell you in one of the cases where the uh, there was some <coughs> related party transaction with regard to the rent one of the icb chairman said nothing doing you have not linked this particular escalation in the rent with either the inflation or something else or the market practices i don't agree with it and he challenged it so to my mind what is more important is that the audit committee chairman should be able to challenge some of the things from the cfo and the other management people and then the directors must know the processes in the company whether they are independent or executive after all but one thing that i must say that independent director is not to block the business i am very clear on that but independent director is definitely there to challenge some of the things where he finds that there is there, there is a probability of something going wrong nrc i have already talked of whenever the proposal for the remuneration increase of the md or anyone else comes in if he, if the nrc is to go say oh, okay yes without even looking at what is the peer companies uh, uh, remunerations with regard to the same positions i think that's not done and unless the audit committee also compares the peer review uh, peer companies performances with this company's performance and then comes to certain conclusions why labor expenses should be 30% in one case whereas in the peer companies this is only about 22% or 23% i think all these things have to be done this homework has to be done by the independent director independent director is not there only to attend a meeting now let's be very clear about it and i think uh, rmc is one area i don't need to say that in one of the major cases which is going uh, a, a, even in sfi or for that matter rmc meetings were never held for a period of 3 years despite the best of the brains being there on the rmc and people do not know what is the what, what what is the risk basically of of this particular company whether it, it faces more of the interest risk or it faces more of a currency risk or it faces more of a business risk or the marketing risk what what kind of risk it faces sometimes i wonder lehman brothers collapsed 
even three months before, nobody knew that what kind of RSK is it running. Or for that matter, Satyam collapsed. Nobody knew why, why, what kind of RSK it is running. So for what the RMC is there? RMC has to be there and the independent directors must know what kind of risk are there. And rather, any director must know what kind of risk the company is exposed to. Sometimes I really start wondering that you give 10 minutes or half an hour to RMC. That, that's not the way the RMC is to be held for that matter. And I think independent directors must start putting their foot down. And similarly, this stable agenda business is a big problem. And if independent directors keep on accepting table agenda, I think they are going to run into problems. Table agenda can be there in very, very extreme circumstances. Otherwise, something, unless you have read it, you have analyzed it, how you can even discuss that particular matter in a meeting. And of course, as I said, uh, today even CSR for that matter is very important. The, the, the CSR committee just cannot keep on discussing this is the amount and this is the utilization. Please find out how it works out to be per person. You say that we are going to educate 50 people at this particular uh, total amount of the CSR to be spent. Work out how much expenditure it works out per person and what is going to be the outcome unless the CSR committee starts getting into the outcome part. It is not going to be um, I, I, I think independent directors in that case may not be able to play that kind of a role. And of course, now ESD, ESD is going to be one of the very, very important factors. I don't want to um, uh, spend too much of time on that. And uh, remuneration of independent directors is a big issue. People have been uh, have, uh, having conflicting opinions. Uh, to my mind, you need to increase the sitting fees of the independent directors. But don't give them the commission. If you give them the commission, I, I think there is a conflict of interest, whatever we may talk about. Whatever we may talk of, there is a conflict of interest. Somewhere or the other, if you are allowing them the uh, commission part thereof. And uh, particularly commission related with the profits. I think in the times to come, and now uh, one thing, Vijayji, you know better, directors have become liable as a reporting agency, even with regard to the PMLA transactions. Circular of 9th May. I think somewhere or the other, each independent director or each director in the company would do well to get at least every six months an audit of PMLA conducted. And if we don't do it, we are running a great risk. Definitely we are running a great risk. And of course, the directors need to be indemnified. Then the insurance needs to be taken. But they, they, it can only be undertaken for the purpose of civil liability. It cannot be undertaken for the purpose of the, uh, the criminal liability in any case. But I, I think they need to be indemnified for the civil liability. To me, the biggest area today that an, in, that an independent director or any director must understand is with regard to the related party transactions and to how to get into the arm's length part thereof. Unfortunately, this is one area which has not received the kind of attention that it should have received of the uh, independent directors. And of course, in the real estate companies, to my mind, the biggest challenge today is the RERA compliance. And it is the compliance of RERA unless the independent directors can get into whether escrow account is actually being used for that particular purpose for which it was opened. Our uh, few of the forensic audits clearly reveal that there has been total ignorance in respect thereof. Viraji, by complimenting you again, I must say it's a great privilege to be in your program today. I congratulate you, but at the same time, I, I really feel concerned about this uh, uh, institution of the independent directors. Somewhere or the other, we need to be far, far more effective. We need to be far, far more vocal. We need to be far, far more scrutinizer than what we have been so far today. If at all the performance of the companies have to improve, if the financial performance, the operating performance of the companies have to improve, 
independent directors have a great role to play there but at the same time they should not be playing an obstructive role they should not be playing a role where they keep on blocking the business of the companies for that matter thank you very much thank you very much thank you amarjit sir you have rightly pointing out the role of independent director and the three four points which you have come out very well that role of independent director is not becoming a part time role now it is becoming a full time things for more aggressive you cannot just go and eat kaju and come back that is one part second is the point your point is very valid that remuneration versus work that is a conflict which is going on yeah. so time independence and then what remuneration they should get and sometimes you want work then you have to pay remuneration that is a one conflict issue it has to be addressed the relating to point risk you have mentioned about the two committees that is very important risk management committee and the it committee now these are the two development committees has to be there where you should realize you can make it committee as a part of the risk committee because what is a technology development is taking place if we are not following you will be far behind the show so thank you very much amarji sir your uh, amarji sir uh, your point and your uh, knowledge and your part as a auditor and independent director and your original um, your uh, aura relating to this particular thing where you are interacting with various type of corporates it's great thank you very much sir for your input thank you so, now we will move uh, next we have mr abhit tandon founder and md institutional investor advisory service private yes. limited and uh, he is now in the limelight every day you are finding that that um, the institutional investors are saying that we are not approving this uh, resolution and we are not accepting this point and they are always in limelight so we have two learned speaker mr amit chandan and mr jn uh, gupta ji both will discuss so amit sir will discuss about the investor stewardship and this concept which is the part and parcel of the governance and the new part of this over to you amit sir much uh, pavan ji it's indeed uh, uh, my pleasure and an honor to be invited to speak on the 150th webinar i've been kind of uh, participant in some of the earlier programs uh, as a speaker i've been a participant as hearing what has to be said so what you've been uh, able to do in the last 3 3 and a half years is truly truly remarkable so i wish you all success in future and i hope that you will continue uh, on this journey i'm going to talk about uh, a very important topic so i would uh, just say that uh, what i will want to say is that uh, you know a lot of the conversation which we've had so far a predominant portion of the conversation has been with regard to what are the expectations from the companies and what is it that they are supposed to do but uh, at the end of the day the equation or the relationship is between two people uh, I, i mean there are employees there are suppliers etc there are other stakeholders but i just want to focus on the relationship between to the investors and the companies both need each other it's not that uh, you know you take away corporates from the equation and uh, investors will be able to survive on their own similarly uh, you take away investors from the equation and while corporates would be able to survive and do something but they may not be able to get uh, capital uh, to grow to the scale and extent which they would want to so therefore there is a very important relationship between the two and so just like there are expectations uh, from uh, uh, corporates there have to be in uh, expectations from investors so stewardship actually refers to and the shorthand i use for uh, stewardship is that what is it that uh, investors are supposed to do and how should they take their responsibilities as investors more clearly um, you have to remember uh, that as investors if you're an insurance company you've gathered money from your uh, policy holders if you're a mutual fund or an asset manager you have gathered money from your various unit holders or mutual uh, fund holders so therefore um, they also have a responsibility to uh, 
the people from whom they've been gathering uh, money from. And uh, it is very important how do they focus on it. Uh, Mr. Amarjit uh, Singh did touch upon the fact that SEBI is given it a lot of thrust. So what I want to do over the next uh, uh, five, 10 minutes uh, with your permission, uh, Pawanji is just walk through uh, what the regulators expect and how is our experience uh, or the Indian experience with uh, stewardship been. Uh, I just want to, uh, uh, and before I do that, I just want to highlight one or two things. Uh, first is if we kind of look at uh, our own uh, shareholding landscape. Uh, if you go back uh, 10 years, 12 years before the financial crisis happened, you will find that uh, most of the equity, about 60% of the equity used to be with the promoters. You had about 20, 25% with the, uh, closer to 20%, but in some instances, 25% with the retail shareholders and the remainder, which was 15, 20% used to be with institutional investors. Today, uh, the promoters hold much, much less. They are kind of closer to 50%. If you look at retail investors, their holding is no longer at that 20%. It's come down by uh, to closer to about 10%. But, uh, and both this gap, which is on the uh, reduction of 20% has been filled up by the institutional shareholders who now own between 30 to 35%. And in some companies, they may be very significant holders. The other uh, development is we are heading towards a, a market where there are very few uh, promoter, uh, there, there, you know, you have very many more professionally owned uh, companies. So if I go back 10 years, if you ask people which are the professionally owned and professionally managed companies in India, people would say, look, there is ITC. Uh, there were views about that. There is the LNT, there is ICICI, and there is HDFC. Today, that number is much, much larger, and it's set to grow. Uh, you have uh, you know, entities like uh, BSC, MCX. Uh, you have uh, companies uh, which have been spawned by ICICI, HDFC Bank, which are the insurance companies. You have a few IT companies which don't have an identified promoter. Uh, then you look at some of uh, the startups. And a lot of them, what is very interesting is that while at the moment they have uh, a significant shareholder by way of private equity, they don't really have any recognized uh, promoter, so to speak. And as the private equity exits, uh, their stake, you will find that the shares are held by a lot of the investors. And therefore, it's important to understand what uh, or how the uh, investors behave. So it is in this context that uh, just after the 2008 financial crisis, and I heard a lot of uh, uh, comments by uh, Mr. Amarjit Chopra before that. Uh, uh, Amarjit also uh, 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 mentioned that uh, you know, compensation is a big issue. So there were issues with regard to compensation, risk, capital allocation. And the view was that the financial crisis in 2008 and 9 was a function of some of these developments. And that you had a lot of the institutional shareholders who weren't paying uh, or who weren't giving sufficient attention uh, to this whole uh, stewardship. So. Uh, uh, in the UK, they kind of wrote out uh, a stewardship code. And the focus of the stewardship code, uh, if I may uh, say, was that they, were, uh, uh, they had come up with a few uh, items on principles of stewardship. Uh, and I can kind of just enumerate them for uh, the purposes of the discussion today. Uh, they said uh, there were uh, seven uh, broad principles which uh, the funds were supposed to uh, adhere to. First was formulate a policy on stewardship. So first recognize that you are a steward and you have a responsibility towards your unit holders, uh, your policy holders, the small shareholders, and you're managing money on behalf of that. The second is have a policy to manage the conflict of interest uh, with regard to stewardship and disclose it publicly. Now, you know, there was this whole uh, discussion on related party transactions, and therefore stewardship also has, you know, you might have 
uh, someone on the trustee board who's also on the board of a company where you've invested. Uh, you may have a business relationship with someone. So therefore, you have to disclose how you're going to manage this stewardship. Uh, it recognizes that there will be some conflicts of interest, but as long as you have uh, a policy. Uh, the others are aspects which we all actually do as investors in India, but it kind of gives it a structure. Uh, first is um, you need to monitor your investee company. So before you uh, invest, you need to figure out which is the company you're going to invest in, why will you invest there. And once you've invested, you need to monitor how it's doing. This monitoring could be in the form of meeting the company. It could be in the form of um, attending investor calls, uh, meeting them one-on-one, -on -one, going for investor day if a sell-side analyst or, or firm has a conference, going and attending that so that you can hear and meet the company. The second is establish clear-cut guidelines on uh, uh, when and how you have an issue. Uh, you're going to escalate this or discuss it with the company. Uh, will you talk to the IR team? Would you want to meet the CFO? Would you want to meet the CEO to discuss it? Do you feel that it's important enough that you need to take it to the board and discuss it collectively with the board? Uh, the fifth uh, element of the code is that uh, uh, they recognize that, look, you may be a small holder, hold one or two percent, someone else might hold one or two percent. So collectively, uh, individually, you may not hold as an investor a significant amount of equity, but collectively, all the investors hold a lot of equity. So you should be able to act collectively. And uh, this is an important carve out because otherwise the view was that, look, uh, as investors, you are acting in concert and therefore it has uh, a lot many other implications uh, as far as the markets uh, are concerned. Uh, 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 Pavanji, when he introduced uh, me, spoke about the fact that as a pro proxy advisory firm, we do have recommendations on voting uh, so one of the things which uh, uh, the uh, uh, stewardship principle says that you should be having a, a clear policy on voting, you should be voting and you should disclose on how you voted. And finally, uh, report periodically on your stewardship activity. I'm very happy to say that even before uh, SEBI and IRDA and uh, the PFRDA, uh, actually came up with a stewardship code, uh, the Indian investors had been focused on it. In fact, much before uh, SEBI rolled out the code, which was 2019, they did ask mutual funds to publish their voting policy way back in uh, 2010. Uh, they asked uh, uh, mutual funds to uh, disclose how they voted on resolutions way back in 2012. Uh, they asked, uh, you know, we introduced uh, e-voting and one of the things where I have to give uh, full credit to SEBI and say we are much, much ahead of even markets like US and UK. We are one of the uh, only markets if, uh, oh, we are not one. We are the only market, if I'm not mistaken, which asks the investors to disclose their voting rationale. If you voted for, please tell us why you voted for. If you voted against, please tell us why you voted against. So this uh, then, uh, you know, this was there. Uh, the PFRDA asked the pension funds to have a stewardship code way back in 2016. IRDA asked the insurance companies to have a stewardship code in 2017 uh, uh, and 18. And then SEBI asked the uh, all funds. So while they were doing their stewardship activities, they said you need to have a formal policy in 2019 and then 2020. Uh, just before the pandemic, they actually asked funds to vote on all resolutions. So we can see that, look, rather than take a deep dive, uh, what SEBI has done is it is, is in steps, uh, but uh, it is uh, and the regulators, and therefore uh, the funds do not have to have, say that, look, there's a lot of onerous responsibilities on us. They've been able to kind of wade into this whole thing and take one step at a time so that they are doing uh, things the right way. Uh, I would like to just, uh, you know, say that uh, just like companies have responsibilities, funds have responsibilities, spelled out in the stewardship code, uh, we've gone about it uh, in regulators in a very measured way and people have adopted it and they've kind of, uh, you kind of see that 
in the level of engagement which investors have with companies you see that in the voting and uh, most important we see it in the improved governance standards in our market i'm going to stop short here i know you have a very interesting agenda in front of you so i'm going to hand the microphone back to uh, pavan ji and uh, thank you all very much for uh, being uh, here at the event this uh, evening thank you thank you very much sir thank you for giving a new dimension of this uh, uh, investor stewardship and you are doing women's service to the investors in india and i think you will continue to do this so our another stalwarts is there mr jn gupta and uh, mr jn gupta is uh, also in the same league and he is also a um, uh, news maker of india and today we want to understand him about the governance aspect of shareholders activism influence and accountability in corporate decision making so gupta ji is coming out with so many reports so many things and so many decision making process and advising to the institutional investor we want to listen him from him side that what is this impact and how it is affecting the governance over to you gupta sir yeah thank you pawan thank you corporate professional without wasting time i will come to the topic immediately and it is very apt that this topic is coming immediately after amit's topic where we were talking about stewardship now on one hand we are calling stewardship and on other hand we are saying it is activism so these two cannot go together activism in my opinion is a negative connotation of the efforts okay when we say the investors have to do their stewardship activity and when they play stewardship activity we say that oh you are a activist so activist as long as they are doing their duty to a their unit holders i don't call it activist and i recall when we started our company there was a program by cnbc tv 18 where amit and subramanyam all three were there and they said is activist so we said i objected i said we are not activist we are educationist our idea is to educate and let people take a informed decision now coming to this topic i am telling it from the both perspective from the perspective of a proxy advisor and from the perspective of a institutional investor now let me talk about proxy advisor first why because they are the initiator in many of the cases for the heightened activity in the voting pattern now where the topic is accountability influence and everything so i will start from this that the responsibility of people like us amit and others who are doing this advising we have a very big responsibility on our head we cannot write anything which is not correct because it may have a very negative impact on the price or very positive impact on the price and we do not want to do that as any other entity if they are doing something wrong and which influences the price they can be accused of prevent and they will can be accused under prevention of fraudulent and unfair trading activity similarly the same responsibility lies on us we cannot write in our report anything which can be perceived or can be taken on some grounds where there will be price risk to the investor of that so our accountability is very high that is where we say as for the influence is concerned i would say that our influence is never direct our influence comes through a channel that is known as institutional investors and we at scs at least always say that no investors shall take our report as a gospel truth the reason is that the unit holders have given their money for management to the institutional investors and they rely on the wisdom of that in investor their performance is judged by their company on that basis 
so they cannot rely on my report or anybody else's report blindly so our report or anybody else's report has to be used as a supplement so we are at best having a indirect influence on the institutional investors now again the problem comes that people like us release report and these reports are used by all investors one investor may be holding 100 shares other will be holding 10 million or 100 million shares report is the same so the reaction has to be different therefore every investor will have to weigh in impact of his decision on the action that he takes based on my report so if he takes purely decision based on my report the decision must be uniform of all the investors which is hardly the case the reason is very simple a investor who holds 10 million shares can pick up a phone and call the company that look these are the problems and if you don't correct it we will exit so the pressure that this is exerted by a substantial investor on the company makes the company alarm and they can force the company to change the course whereas a person who holds 100 share doesn't matter at all into the company so the influence always depend upon where is your standing now the question that comes is this that what happens and how we say that it is the influence we have around 11 years plus of our existence in the market and we have seen a lot of changes that has happened if i recall the first resolution to be defeated was resolution for tata motors remuneration resolution and then siemens divesting a their substantial business to a group company so these are the two first resolution which were defeated sometime in 2013 and 2014 from that time we have moved and we have seen a lot many resolutions have been defeated and i think this year probably 40 50 resolution have been defeated so that is one impact that is there as amit was giving data on the participation of institutional investor it has improved a lot but i don't think i have to take credit for it a, or maybe a very small credit can go to company like us the game changer was e voting that is started by the company or the company must after company act the e voting started which enabled participation the second thing was the mandate by sebi and irda for voting by the institutional investors so that came but the bigger change that i have seen is because of investors influence on the company the company themselves have become very sensitized towards proxy advisory report because the company now know that although the voting is done by investors but a lot of input goes from the proxy advisor side so any negative impact any negative opinion that proxy advisors are giving to in the company their report to company that is taken seriously by the company so when we started in 2012 if we wanted to talk to a company the company will pick up the phone and we say we are from ses they will shut the phone and bang it on our ear but today the situation is changed the company reaches out to us and say when are you sending your report to us not only that there is a window for giving air to the opinions of company so we have a system of addenda and this year we have issued 280 addendums so in a 800 odd company that we have covered 280 addendums have been issued that means 280 company found something worthy of writing to us by disagreeing with us or by giving additional information so that is the sensitivity that has come to companies that if you do not agree with in proxy advisory report you can always revert and the proxy advisory company is duty bound to ent entertain your opinion and give it to the same level of investors while we do this in the 280 nnm that we have issued 
we are very happy to say that except one, we have not changed any recommendation based on any mistake that we have made. The recommendations have been changed based on input, additional input that they have provided or based on the change that they have made. So this is where the journey has come. But we have a still very, very big thing to achieve. One thing that I would say that let us remove the concept that if somebody is voting, he is activist. In general election of the country, I, I vote, you vote and everybody votes. We are not activists. Similarly, all stakeholders should vote and participate. Today, the situation that you see that there are three types, three basic categories of shareholders, promoters, institutional investors and retail investors. Retail investor participation is still very, very low. And I would say not more than 5%, even much below 5%. Except few cases where retail investors have voted very high, which we find are a very susceptible cases because there is something wrong if suddenly you find in a company 100% or 80% of retail investors have voted. Institutional investors voting has increased, but still it is limited mainly to which are mandated by their charter or by the regulator. So FIIs are voting, insurance companies are voting, mutual funds are voting, but still PMS is out of coverage and then all other corporate shareholders are out of coverage. So we need to increase their participation in order to have certain meaningful there. Now, the influence part is concerned. I would say that Influence should not be read in a negative manner because objective of investors as well as promoters or as well as the people who are on the board, everybody is working towards a common objective. The common objective is wealth creation for all stakeholders or facility for stakeholders. So if I am working on the same ground, you're working for the same purpose and somebody else is working for the same purpose, we are aligned. So I would be or I would say that investors should be able to influence the company to get to the best corporate governance, to the best value creation and an environment where every someone is taken care of. I think I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Gupta ji, uh, for uh, giving a nice uh, point. But I just uh, wondering uh, about the shareholders participation through institutional investor, I think that awareness is required. You know that uh, uh, in the national election, the government and the election commissioner is promoting this. Uh, I am a very, uh, I'm a literate person and I'm a shareholder of various company, but sometimes what is happening, I'm not voting. And why I'm not voting? Because I think that what will be the impact? So I think there is a need that we should start a positive campaigning and simultaneously I should have a purpose to vote yes and no and no vote because the clarity should be there because under the legal parameter and under legal protects so many things are there. It is my just one suggestion. Regulator is also sitting here. He can uh, just... Uh, I, will, I will add Pavan here. Yeah. See, when you say people are not waiting, there are two, three reasons. Yeah. If you recall, for 30 years back or 40 years back, the voting percentage in national election used to be 30%, 35%. Yeah. Today, it is 67, 70% in something. Because yeah. people have come to know that their vote matters. Similarly, as for the corporates are concerned, every retail investor feel that their vote will not matter, but collectively their vote may matter, especially in resolution which are minor, majority of minority. The second thing is this, which I have been always saying, that everything has been created, but knowledge is still lacking. See, the e-voting has brought everything possible for the investors to vote. But the investor doesn't understand a difference between ordinary resolution, special resolution, ordinary business, special business, 
investor doesn't know what is a independent director what is a non independent director what is the difference between manager and executive director so the knowledge gap is there so an investor who doesn't know anything how can he vote i have always been suggesting is that that i at least ses is willing to offer all its reports free of cost to retail investors so that retail investors can read the report and vote but again it is a work in process it will happen but eventually it will happen and hopefully in my lifetime it will happen okay sir i will share with you uh, but shortly i'm just telling that we should do the education initiative we should awareness campaigning we should do user friendly platform like multilingual support also because so many people are across the country we should provide incentive and benefit to the shareholder which you have mentioned just now giving a report company can also give discount on their product if you vote and engagement of the shareholders and then collaboration with the intermediaries and board and management endorsement uh, lead by some example and regulatory compliance and regulatory communication all these things combined together we can do so I, thank I, you I, I, i would strongly agree with discount on product we don't want to make it assembly election that i will give you a laptop and bicycle and you vote for me <laughs> <laughs> but today sir nobody comes on the boat uh, if you do give this okay no no i'm sure no okay. i i don't okay. want by skill in the vote yeah. thank, thank you very much gupta sir thank you very thank much you. Uh, and you are and doing i will leave because i have another meeting okay thank so now our next speaker is mr vs sundareshan executive director sebi and as you are aware that he is a strong supporter of good governance and he is in our a uh, various session because he is taking multiple session more than 400 sessions he has taken across the country in the international forum and he always promote governance and transparency so today we want to discuss uh, this uh, particular thing with him transparency the bedrock of the good governance over to you and topics related to the uh, governance donation good evening all the best evening, and sorry i have to leave okay No problem, sir. I heard you fully. Thank you. It was very nice hearing you. Yes. Yeah. Over, over to you, sir. Sir. Yes, sir. Um, good evening to all of you. I thank uh, Mr. Pawan as well as the team of corporate professionals for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity. And I have to join a little late because I was uh, held up with uh, some other meeting. But still, Mr. Pawan has been kind enough to accommodate me. and uh, the topic given to me is um, um, you know transparency is the bedrock or hallmark of uh, governance so i would like to you know take about uh, three four uh, <clears throat> bullet point type of thing to say that why we should have transparency first let us understand the how the securities market was functioning 25 years back and how it is functioning especially the secondary market where the trading has been taking place those who are born <clears throat> 25 years back into the securities market not the real but what i mean is they should have entered the securities market somewhere in 80s or 90s they will be knowing how the transactions used to take place on the floor of the exchange how the prices were disseminated to their clients what type of communication was sent all these things were known to people who were trading at that point of time now just travel back travel 25 years later today how the trading is taking place how the communication is being given and what type of benefits it has brought into the secondary market now if you know that the whether it is liquidity whether it is price discovery whether it is the confidence whether it is the trust whether it is the integrity on the market everything has improved multifold now let us first apply this principle to the governance in the corporate sector has a whole if you bring transparency what happens is number one you will your customers will have trust in you your investors will have trust in you and it will increase your goodwill it will increase your acceptability and it will at the end of the day it will increase your commercial ability and competitive spirit in the system this is one aspect now the other aspect is assuming that you want to remain non transparent what will what will be the effect of that now one is what i said is the benefit of transparency now let us understand the benefit of non transparency now the technology is driving all of us 
and digitization is taking place at a speed which is beyond imagination of anybody. Now, based on my experience in the, you know, in SEBI in the last you know, four or five years, especially in surveillance department, when we do search and seizure and collect certain devices from the entities whom we suspect, many people are thinking that once I, I erase the uh, you know, messages, once I erase it, everything will get deleted and I will not be able to get back or something. But recently in one live case, what has happened was that when the new SIM card was put, automatically it downloaded whatever was there earlier, which was deleted. Now, it is how, you know, if you are not so precise, nuanced, tech savvy, whatever you try to hide or, you know, erase, it will come back and it will actually demonstrate to the entire world that you are trying to play some mischief. So if you are, if you, what I'm trying to say is that if you attempt to be non-transparent, the digital age is such that it will expose you at one point of time. Now, uh, you know, if, if you have uh, listened carefully to Mr. Jain Gupta, he specifically said that they will come out with some sort of a report and then the opportunity will be given to the company to agree or disagree or whatever it is. Now, assuming a situation where the company has attempted to hide something and they remind, they intended not to be transparent. Now, people like Mr. Amit Dangan or Mr. Um, Jain Gupta, through their own research and other things, they will bring it out. When they bring it out, your non-transparency will get exposed. And once your non-transparency gets exposed, you will be forced to defend what you try to hide. Now, it will only add to the cost. So, the first point is, if you are transparent, it will bring good big. If you are transparent, it will help you to earn the trust of the people. On the other hand, if you are non-transparent in the digital world, the digitalization or the technology will expose you at one point of time. And at the time, the price you have to pay for defending your non-transparency earlier will be of very high. Secondly, there are agencies, there are uh, institutions which are monitoring you and they will expose your non-transparency and again you will get exposed. So either way, in today's situation, what, what, the, what we need is that whether the regulator enforces transparency or whether it is to be voluntary transparency, my work is to say that it is better to be voluntarily transparent. Now, the, the, the other aspect is that by doing this voluntary transparency, can it be imposed to a regulatory framework? That is what, no, one, one thing is clear. You have to be transparent. If you try to be non-transparent, you will get exposed. So if you don't want to get exposed, be transparent. Now, whether in today's situation, the way things are happening, can the regulatory framework go on writing rules and regulations to impose this transparent governance? That is, that is the point I would like to, uh, to talk about is that can we, will it come, will, it, will this change has to come on its own or can it come through regulatory framework? Now here, what I would like to say is that the, whatever be the amount of regulatory framework you bring, whatever the type of rules you prescribe, at the end of the day, governance is more like a behavior, more like a, uh, you know, attitude. It is, it is something which is human related. It is not mechanically transformed. Writing a regulation or writing a program or a writing, a, writing an algo, you can't convert a non, um, uh, you know, a misgovernance into governance. For the purpose of ensuring transparency and good governance, it has to flow from within. Now, it has to flow from within to what extent the regulatory framework can help you. So it is like taking the horse to the water. At the end of the day, you know, you can, the, the, the horse has to drink the water. If something has to be eaten, the person has to eat. You cannot continuously inject and then ensure that the person is surviving. That is not possible. Similarly, but in order to imbibe this transparency into the governance, I feel that there is a need to have a cultural change. People have to accept that the fact that 
transparency is good transparency is beneficial transparency is is is, is the uh, you know fountain for future survival now in order to enable that type of acceptance as a regulator it is our job as a market participants it is collective responsibility as a, you know mr pawan said in the earlier session that we need to educate the people who are concerned with that and then make them realize that no longer it is going to help you if you remain non transparent this message need to be conveyed and and that has to be accepted that has to be absorbed and then one has to make a sincere attempt to change over a period of time this cannot change over time but it will change over a period of time now whether it will change in one year whether it will change in two years my personal take is that one generation has to change because anybody who has been you know trained brought up you know in a span of about 25 years it could be difficult for the person to change so for this change to bring i think maybe one generation we have i think the present generation which which we are living we have to accept it maybe the next generation which is coming most likely will be more transparent than what they are see in india now most of the people are willing to do digital payments very few people are still willing to transact through cash because this is a change how so ever you try to impose it will not change but people are realizing the convenience people are realizing the benefit of doing a digital payment it is faster it is safe same way in governance also if that type of understanding is you know percolated down the line that transparency will help transparency will you know enhance the goodwill in the system and in turn bring commercial benefits i am sure the generation to come will definitely adopt it and realize that but for transparency governance can no longer survive so once they realize that i am sure governance standards will improve and will bring benefits not only for the corporates but also the you know the entire value chain participants whether it is government whether it is the investor whether it is the common public or any service provider or any other value chain in the system will get the benefit therefore my point is that transparency is and the only way one can do it and it has to be followed it has to it will bring benefits but it will take time to change i think uh, you know a lot of time has been spent on this issue and therefore i would like to stop here thank you very much thank you sundarshan sir uh, before you uh, joined i told one important point earlier we were saying cash is the king now today in the world in the corporate world the governance is the king if you have a governance if you have a transparency you will be the king in the market people will follow you investor will follow you bankers will follow you your stakeholders will follow you and you will be identified a diamond a pole in the market so thank you very much for giving the importance of transparency and the value Uh, attached to the transparency and the most important message you have given the governance is a behavior attitude of a of a corporate uh, uh, leaders it is not a programming which you can write and you can uh, you can say so thank you very much sir the same governance and transparency point now i will request parvati sir he is a student at present and he is speaking from cambridge Uh, he has gone for a study there and i was telling him i am envying you you are studying you are a lucky person and he is uh, uh, speaking from cambridge university so over to you pk i know you have given lots of example of how you have come forward and um, uh, the topic which we want to discuss with you the shaping tomorrow's boardroom and enhancing board effectiveness and the international the global trend in governance over to you pk without wasting any time thank you uh, thank you uh, pavan uh, thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, yeah i'm happy to be sitting at one of the most iconic universities of the world uh, which has stood tall for 800 years and uh, kind of speak from this premises uh, thank you 
So I have been given two topics. I will take the second topic first, which is the global trends in corporate governance. And I think uh, we in India are not uh, uh, alien to some of the trends that are uh, that we are seeing seeing uh, shape the global corporate governance. Uh, I think fundamentally the purpose of the corporation itself is changing. Uh, we for long kind of uh, thought that uh, corporate governance and uh, the role of the board uh, is to shareholders. Uh, shareholder democracy was considered to be the prime reason for corporate governance. Uh, from there, of course, we are now moving towards uh, stakeholder primacy. Uh, even the Companies Act of 2013 clearly uh, articulates the position that uh, the company and the board owes a duty to the stakeholders at large uh, and not just to the shareholders. So that's a fundamental shift that's happening. And uh, the rest of the interventions that are happening actually uh, aligns to this fundamental shift. Of course, not all countries are uh, at the same kind of uh, maturity level as far as this concept is concerned. Uh, there is also not much of legal jurisprudence on uh, how the courts will look at uh, the stakeholder primacy concept of corporate governance. So we will need to wait uh, for a few more years before we see some kind of literature coming from probably courts in the US or courts in the Europe. Um, I don't really expect a matter to go into the Indian courts as far as this topic is concerned. Um, so stemming from the fundamental premise that the purpose of the corporation itself is changing, um, clearly we are seeing three trends that are shaping the whole of corporate governance uh, space. One is we've, I think, moved or we are moving towards uh, focusing on long-term sustainable value creation. Uh, we are not now interested, or at least we are not excessively focused on the short term, which is quarter on quarter. So companies and CEOs of corporations have started speaking about creating long-term sustainable value and also allocating capital for long-term projects. So I think that's the first fundamental you know, kind of shift that's happening globally. Um, second, you are seeing the disclosure regime change. Um, you had speakers from uh, SEBI, you had speakers from the proxy advisory firms. Uh, all of them do contribute to this change in the disclosure regime. Uh, what was considered to be a compliance-driven uh, mechanism uh, has now become more a governance-driven mechanism. What was uh, very narrow uh, in terms of disclosures uh, most of our disclosures a decade back carried only the uh, the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement, and of course the director's report. But even the director's report was very, very uh, compliance driven, or it had what it need to have statutorily, nothing beyond that. But now today you see uh, the way India is actually progressing on disclosures. Uh, we've got the business responsibility and sustainability report, and the nine principles which kind of if a company does a good job, uh, it's uh, it's so much of comprehensive data and holistic data, not just for the shareholder, but all of the stakeholders, whether it's customers, whether it's suppliers, whether it's the government, whether it is um, the civic society, et cetera, et cetera. So you're seeing that the disclosure regime has completely changed and is becoming extremely comprehensive. Um, so that's another kind of uh, shift that you're seeing. Um, this shift, of course, India has been at the forefront. Uh, Europe is also kind of uh, there. But as far as the US is concerned, they still are with the 10K, which is more the financial and operating kind of matrices, not so much on the e, uh, uh, environment and social. But I think there's going to be rules from the SEC on climate disclosures uh, very soon. Um, that's the second trend. And the third trend uh, that uh, I just spoke of is shareholder versus stakeholder. So if you see all these three, short-term versus long-term, uh, disclosures becoming from compliance to more governance, shareholder to stakeholder, these are all real, real big shifts in the corporate governance uh, framework. And it really changes the way we look at governance. And what it means is uh, for people like us who are uh, general counsels, company secretaries, 
uh, professionals advising management and the board, we also have to change the way we think. We need to unlearn a few things. We need to relearn uh, and we need to kind of start becoming broad in the way we think on many of these mechanisms uh, because uh, basically the fundamental, fundamentally there is a shift in the way corporate governance is being looked at. So what it means is today, uh, uh, typically disclosures, when you take, disclosures are meant to you know, give investors a sense of what is affecting the company. That's what disclosures is all about. If there is an impact on the company, uh, you disclose so that investors are able to take an informed decision. But today you've switched that, the, the, the trend has changed. Now you're asking companies to disclose how they are impacting the ecosystem. For example, if you take the GHG, um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, disclosure, or the water consumption, the air quality, these are actually um, disclosures where the company is actually impacting the environment and the ecosystem. So you are seeing a two-way disclosures, what impacts the company and how the company impacts the ecosystem. So both are becoming equally important. One actually is helping the investors to make a decision. Another is also probably helping the investor to make a decision, but more is actually becoming a societal kind of goal because a lot more other stakeholders like uh, your employees, customers, vendors, civic society also get to read what is the impact that you are actually having on the ecosystem. So the disclosures have actually moved two way rather than one way. And hence, because the disclosures have moved two way, the expectations from shareholders also are becoming very, very high. Uh, you will see now in most of the AGMs, you will have questions around environment. You will have questions around your CSR activities. You will have questions around your ethics policies, the whistleblowing mechanism, et cetera, et cetera, rather than just having questions on financial metrics. So the stakeholders' um, expectations are changing, which means the companies also have to kind of shape and uh, make their stakeholder management interventions much, much more robust. So that's what it means. So these are some of the governance mechanisms or governance trends that I am seeing uh, unfold globally. Uh, clearly, India, it has already played out uh, and we are actually preparing uh, to kind of navigate through these. And of course, Europe is certainly at the forefront of the stakeholder uh, governance model. US is in some sense catching up. Uh, and of course, in all these, proxy advisory firms play a very important role. Uh, they have immensely contributed uh, to companies re-looking at the disclosure regime. Uh, while in India, the proxy advisory firms uh, may not be directly be very effective because of the ownership structure, but certainly they have certainly contributed immensely, immensely on the way every company looks at their disclosures. And before kind of anybody sends out a disclosure out into the uh, into the shareholders, uh, uh, you know, uh, domain, people will look at the guidelines issued by these proxy advisory firms. And I think they're going to play much more uh, robust uh, 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 role as we go along because they now have shifted their uh, goalpost as well from only looking at governance and financial metrics to environment and social matrices too. So they're also going to advise on that. So I think it's going to be very interesting uh, the next five to 10 years is going to be very, very exciting uh, for all companies in India. And so is for the company secretaries. And I think it's a huge opportunity for us to uh, unlearn few things, relearn few things and be future fit. So that's on the second topic, which is the global trends. As far as shaping numerous board and enhancing boards are concerned, uh, I think uh, obviously board is one of the key players in the governance framework. Uh, so what it means is the boards also have to relook at few things. Uh, they need to certainly relook at their composition. Uh, typically, every board has a lot of general management or finance people uh, uh, sitting on the boards, but now diversity matters. Uh, diversity in terms of uh, understanding international affairs, because you can see now the kind of geopolitics uh, political risk that is going to impact businesses. 
uh, you had Russia Ukraine crisis. Now you have uh, the Palestine Israel crisis. So geopolitics becomes very important because we don't operate in silos. We do operate uh, in a in a world where uh, what happens elsewhere does impact our operations. So the composition of board needs to obviously be relooked at, and it needs to have much more diversity diversity in terms of skills, not just in terms of gender. Uh, I think topics which will now become extremely important is geopolitics, uh, ESG, uh, cybersecurity, data analytics, um, and nurturing talent. I think these are things which will become extremely important. Uh, I think we've been enough and more matured in terms of handling the, 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 the items relating to normal business operations, financial reporting process, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to some of these items which I mentioned, I think there needs to be some amount of capacity building, um, refinement in skills, and hence the composition might have to change. Uh, the second uh, place where I look at uh, boards uh, uh, becoming different is uh, in the way they will build their capacity and capability. Obviously, I think uh, the familiarization programs and awareness programs will need to become much, much more robust. And that's now need of the hour. Uh, it's certainly very important for uh, all board members because uh, the changes are so many that no one independent director or no uh, full-time director can keep track unless the person goes back to a refresher course or an awareness session. So uh, capacity building and refreshing one's own skills becomes equally important. Um, but at the same time, I think boards must be very clear on the role that they play. Uh, they must be very careful not to step into the shoes of the management becomes extremely important for the boards to be very effective. Uh, at the same time, have very strong process management. And of course, be aligned on uh, very strategic matters because today uh, corporations, um, uh, there's so much of uncertainty around the world that the boards are called upon to look at the strategic aspects of the corporations uh, very, very minutely. So there needs to be an alignment on strategic aspects and of course, doesn't mean that all of them agree on everything, but nonetheless, there needs to be healthy debate. There needs to be healthy discussion. And of course, um, a good board to be effective will need to make sure that it has created a culture of uh, candor, uh, trust, cohesiveness, and of course, open dissent. Um, and this will only happen uh, not just by management giving information to the board, but board dynamics becomes extremely important and uh, the chairperson of the board will play a pivotal role in making sure that the board is cohesive, there is trust among individual board members, there is individual accountability, at the same time, there is accountability at the collective level, and finally, that the board evaluates itself collectively uh, so that they can actually provide the much required strategic guidance to the management and the corporation. So that's what I see uh, uh, happening at the board level. Few things for the boards to really um, uh, kind of uh, keep in mind to avoid. Uh, first thing is, of course, to understate the importance of compliance. Uh, we are really seeing uh, compliance is becoming uh, very, very mainstream. It's basic discipline for any corporation. So it's important not to undermine the importance of compliance. Uh, the trap of homogeneity, it's, uh, it's never good to be, uh, uh, to fall into the trap of homogeneity just because four of the six board members agree on something doesn't mean that it should always be right. People can have differences of opinion and I think they should speak up uh, vociferously and put forth their views firmly but respectfully. Um, avoiding anchoring effect, certainly uh, you don't want the chairperson of the board introducing the proposal and also giving his or her views ahead of discussion. Uh, if the chairperson does that, uh, it, they, it leads to a, a anchoring effect where other directors might just get influenced. So it's best to avoid anchoring effect so that the board boards are more effective. Um, and finally, ignoring interest of uh, stakeholders. I think it's extremely important now that every decision taken 
is evaluated uh, holistically and then a decision is arrived. Not that the decisions will always be right. Uh, there will be competing interests. There will be challenges. But at the end of the day, I think a holistic uh, consideration of all issues uh, uh, and interests of all stakeholders uh, is, is paramount. Uh, and I think only after that, capital should be allocated. Um, so I think some of these things will go a long way in making sure the boards are effective. So uh, given that it's been a long day, I will stop here, Pawan, and uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, PK. Thank you, giving a new dimension of uh, boardroom and what are the new things and global trend which is happening. You are absolutely right. The board will not discuss only the financial things. Board will discuss, and I remember you were the person who has told long back that compliance of financial will reduce drastically and it will reduce to not more than 20% as compared to the overall compliance and 80% will be non-financial compliance. You mentioned when we were making a vision of ICSI, I remember this and it is coming true. And no doubt today the boardroom will not discuss only on the financial, they will discuss all the entire thing because your business is affecting not only with your, your country's thing, your geopolitical situation is also important across the world. You will not only talk about the, just uh, uh, your business, you have to talk about the ESG, you have to talk about the cyber security, you have to say, talk about the risk management, you have to talk about the compliance, you have to talk about the transparency. So these are the things which will come in, and Amarjit sir has mentioned this, that cultural audit will be a new dimension when every company has to go for this. So all these new dimensions are coming and I'm happy that you, when you will come back after completing your course, you will bring so many new things and guide us for this. So thank you, uh, um, uh, PK. Uh, Thanks so much. For participating. So friends, now it's the time to uh, close this, these sessions. As you're aware that what, people, all the speakers and others say, transparency governs, build trust. Transparent governance will trust and trust is the foundation upon which prosperous and enduring corporate empires are built. Another point is, which I was also selling, cash is, the cash is king, now the governance is king. Good governance is not only just a moral imperative. It is a strategic advantage. You take this. Company with a strong governance practices are better equipped to navigate challenges and seize opportunities. So you can understand by doing this, you can earn better. And today we have seen those good government companies are getting better uh, uh, peer uh, uh, valuation as compared to normal company. With this thing, we are coming to end of this program. And I will I thanks uh, all my learned speaker. First, Andrada Madam, then Amarjit uh, uh, Singh Sir, then Amarjit Chopra Sir, JN Gupta Ji, Amit Tendon Ji, Sudreshan Sir, and uh, um, uh, uh, PK for participating. And this is our 150th webinar. So the presence of all the dignities, liberties has uh, given the um, uh, flying colors to our program. And you are always helping us and we are sharing this knowledge to the corporate world. And friends, uh, my all participants, those who are uh, here, always they are coming in numbers. Thank for them. Thank for them. Uh, uh, thank you for participating. And uh, I will just request everyone that this journey of knowledge sharing will not stop here. It will continue. And with your help, we will just stay. As a ritual, uh, we have a just 30 seconds uh, uh, wrap up from all our parts, uh, all our uh, panelists. So I will start Amarji sir, Amarji Chopra sir, just uh, the topic which you have discussed, your last final words. Sir, you have to unmute yourself. So I must say this was very, very interesting. And uh, the viewpoint of everyone, and as you said, and everyone said, Transparency is going to be the key and particularly this uh, uh, digitalization will bring in so much of information at the doorstep of the SEBI 
and other regulators that it will be difficult to default i i think that's the key point to my mind okay. and i think as directors now the emphasis has to be not on financial figures alone it has to be on the qualitative discussions within the board i oh. think the quality of the discussion has to be the key very frankly so that that is where i will like to end up okay amit sir amit sir your take on so oh, it's been uh, i really enjoyed this discussion we have kind of covered a lot of grounds in terms of looking at uh, the evolution but equally importantly what is it that we can expect and as uh, you know it's been said repeatedly and uh, what mr amit chopra just reiterated the fact that we have to start looking beyond numbers and while uh, you know the shorthand for that is esg i think the roles and responsibilities of companies are set to change how they report on that is set to change what they disclose is set to change and we've got um, interesting times ahead of us okay pk you are word of uh, uh, my only word of uh, uh, this one is uh, being honest is the best policy <laughs> Okay, sir. Sir, last word, uh, Sudarshan sir. Um, go. I have said about uh, transparency, but if I say in one word, numbers are no longer going to decide the future of any corporate entity. It is going to be beyond numbers. Now, what is that beyond number? Uh, Whereas Amit says, whether it is ESG, I don't want to use terminologies because these terminologies keep changing. So the point is that non-numbers are going to play a very, very significant role than the numbers which were playing about a decade or back. So, so in, if you see, ten to fifteen years down the line, people are not going to talk about what this company has done, how much profit they made. They are going to talk something more than that. and people have to remember what is that as a vision and accordingly adapt to themselves to that requirement otherwise you may be making big profits but you will be left to behind in the uh, you know reputation or good will or the market share or whatever you call that's all absolutely right corporate success is not defined solely by profits it is equally about the integrity of decision made and the ethical path taken good governance ensure that business thrive with both purpose and profits so that is a there is a crux for suggestion sir has said so thank you very much all my learned friends thank you very much uh, this journey will continue so 27th october 4 pm we will again meet with some new topic some new idea and some new thoughts thank you very much till then thank you thank you both thank you